Well, last Sunday, while you were hearing John and I guess being rained on, we were in, Lynette and I were having a lovely day in Murchison for a grandchild's birthday. I see some smiles, so some of you know that it's little more than a crossroads between mountains, halfway between Nelson and Greymouth. Prior to the party, we went for a drive to enjoy the mass magnificent scenery that surrounded us. We came to a lookout over the Maruia Falls. Being 10 meters high, they make a pretty big splash. But once having lived near Niagara Falls, I wasn't overly impressed. <laughs> Returning to town, we still had some time to kill before the party, so we visited the Murchison Historical Museum. There I learned that on June 16, 1929, the falls didn't exist. After the 7.8 earthquake the following day, there were falls on the Maruia River. Now I was impressed. That is truly a seismic change. Such a change occurred the day a lawyer decided to test his skills of argument and knowledge of the Torah against Jesus. He wasn't interested in obtaining eternal life. He was only interested in besting Jesus in an argument for his own self-aggrandizement. He got more than he bargained for. For when he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He got the well-known parable of the Good Samaritan. The day before this encounter, there was no such thing as a good Samaritan. It was inconceivable. The Samaritans were considered half-breed heretics who it was socially acceptable to despise and hate. After the parable, their brand changed. Today, hospitals, charitable agencies, churches, and even laws protecting doctors when assisting the injured are happy to be called Good Samaritan. Along with the prodigal son, it is Jesus' most well-known parable. It is, but because of its familiarity, we have grown blasé about it. We have forgotten what it was like before he raised our consciousness. Worse, we have stopped thinking about what he was really saying. We assume we know about it already. For instance, if I were to give a quickie quiz to people out on the street, and ask if Jesus answered the question about who is my neighbor, I think most would answer yes, the Good Samaritan. They would be wrong. Jesus does not answer the question, but asks more questions. The neighbor in the story is unidentified. He is the one who got mugged stripped of his clothing, and robbed of his ID, he could have been anyone, maybe even us. Before Jesus told the parable, it was perfectly acceptable to think of God's love being limited to your own kind. People's gods then belong to the tribe. I know it sounds really primitive, to think that God only loves people who sing the same national anthem that we do, or share the same color of skin, or have our gender, or share our same sexual preference, or worship the same God in the same way. But really, people once thought that way. And here is something even stranger. 
people used to spend a lot of time wondering just how little they had to do to obtain God's love. What was the minimum necessary, what was the minimum necessary requirement to keep their God on their side? I know, it's hard to believe that people were once so self-serving, but I assure you it is true. But worst of all, before the parable, people thought holiness and fear could coincide hand in glove. That's why the priest and Levite could walk by the distressed neighbor without apparent guilt or shame. Helping him would have defiled them. They would have jeopardized their holiness to intentionally become unclean was a fearful thought and an unimaginable act. It was this idea of holiness that Jesus challenged with his parable, and it was no small thing. It was a 7.8 earthquake that changed the topography of faithfulness, righteousness, was no longer about what we do or don't do, but how we are. It was about being. The lawyer claimed to be seeking how to obtain eternal life. I understand that to mean God's unlimited love, compassion, and mercy. He was confident he already knew the answer. Follow the law. The law said, love your neighbor. But surely God didn't mean everyone. Be reasonable. There have to be limits. He didn't hear the irony of his own question. Jesus' parable played with his blindness. If you are one with unlimited love, is it even possible to limit your love? To use our fears or the law or traditions or scripture or even our personal claims on God, to limit that love was a non-starter for Jesus. Limited love is no love at all. That message rattled the windows of the powerful and knocked their means of control off their neatly stacked shelves. It created a chasm in the social order. It shook the ground of their being. It was an unexpected message that made Jesus exceedingly dangerous. Their only hope, was to, rest their only hope to restore order was to silence the messenger. But while you can clean up and rebuild after an earthquake, the landscape is forever changed. Putting the unlimited love of God back in the box of our religion after the parable of the Good Samaritan is proving to be impossible, but not for lack of trying. In the last couple of weeks, I've witnessed lots of attempts to limit God. Recently, the presiding bishop of the U.S., Catherine Jeffers Shorey, was in England. When she was invited to preach at Southwark Cathedral, Archbishop Rowan Williams forbid her to wear her mitre, the sign of her office. As she put it, how bizarre. Well, not so bizarre in a country that is arguing this week at their general synod whether or not God intended women to be bishops. But before we start referring to them as those bloody palms, when she was here recently, the Bishop of Christ Church forbid Catherine to even be in her cathedral. 
A woman bishop forbidding another woman bishop to be in her cathedral goes beyond even bizarre. Her reason was not Catherine's gender, but seemingly her belief that God's limits, her belief that God limits love by demanding unity within the Anglican communion. Since the U.S. is ordaining gays and lesbians as bishops, Bishop Victoria attempted to keep Christ's church pure by being inhospitable to the highest ranking leader of the American church. Happily, not all of New Zealand chooses to be 100% pure. When in Auckland, the presiding bishop was invited not only to preach at the cathedral, but to wear mitre as well. I am told both she and it were greatly admired. Following this week of attempted God containment came the hermeneutics hui I mentioned two weeks ago I was attending. It was another effort to put God back in the box. The structure was built around the three tikanga of Pakeha, Mari, and Polynesia. Each took responsibility for examining a passage from either the Old or New Testament that has been traditionally used to justify the condemnation and exclusion of homosexuals. There are not many to choose from, so the Sodom and Gomorrah story, a passage from Leviticus, and Paul's letter to the Romans and to, the first, and to the, his first letter to the Corinthians were looked at. You might ask, why not a passage from any of the Gospels? Well, it seems Jesus never thought an issue that is fracturing the Anglican communion today was really worth mentioning then. It turns out that these passages that clearly condemn homosexuality are not so clear after all. Three Pakeha theologians from Auckland, Waiapu, and Nelson prese um, presented first on the Sodom and Gomorrah story. Two of them pretty much demolished the idea that the sin of Sodom was homosexuality. Violent, abusive sex, yes. Inhospi inhospitality, yes. Homosexuality, no. The theologian from Nelson tried to make a case for the sin being homosexuality, but it was pretty weak. I'm not certain even she was convinced. The next presentation was by the Mari Tikanga on the Holiness Code prohibition of a man lying with a man like a woman in Leviticus. While generally conservative theologically, the Mari presenters were not troubled by the idea of including gays and lesbians into their common life. It is for them a matter of hospitality. One Mari Synod only a couple of weeks ago approved by an overwhelming 80% to ordain gays and lesbians. It still has to be approved by the whole Tikanga, but I found that encouraging. Tikanga Polynesia gave the third presentation on Paul's letter to the Romans. It became evident that the Polynesian church, while in many ways the most conservative of the three Tikanga, is untroubled by what they consider the third gender, homosexuality. But while they are a long way from focusing on whether or not to ordain gays and lesbians, they already associate the third sex with the sacred. I found that promising. The conservative evangelicals were not particularly pleased with how the hui was going up to this point although some admitted it was opening their thinking on the subject. However, their moment came in the last presentation made by, the by an evangelical professor of New Testament. He built his case against inclusion 
of the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender community on Paul's prohibition of male homosexuality in his first letter to the Corinthians. Paul gives a list of people whose actions are obviously not loving, like adulterers and murderers, to which he adds a word for men who lie with men, sometimes translated as homosexuals. Paul states these people will not inherit the kingdom of God, which is his way of saying eternal life, or my way of saying God's unlimited love, compassion, and mercy. The question raised is, should the church exclude them as well? After his presentation, I asked if he thought Paul believed a homosexual was incapable of showing God's unlimited love compassion, and mercy, because that would mean he was already a recipient of eternal life. He had no answer. I found that hopeful. While reading about the Maruia Falls in the museum, I also found it interesting that when the earthquake first created them, they were only a few meters high. But over the next 80 years, the falling water eroded the riverbed below, making them their present more dramatic height. I suppose it is possible in a thousand years or more, they might approach the height of Niagara Falls. The parable of the Good Samaritan was a mighty earthquake. It unchurched God. It made love, compassion, and mercy more important than holiness. It made hospitality more important than the law. While the church still tries to limit God's love, the aftershocks of the parable continue to be felt. The unlimited love of God continues to shape the landscape. Even the church can't contain it. Amen.